All right, I think that's the signal to start. Um, uh, good morning, welcome back. Um, so today I want to talk about some, some X computations. In light and then some English. Um, so I guess this is the basic claim is that uh, this category of condensed or light condensed being group is a very convenient framework for doing homological algebra. It's a very nice being category. You can form without any problems. You can form a derived category. Um, and because like topological spaces essentially should fully faithfully in condensed sets, also topological the being groups basically should fully face. I mean, under some very much assumptions, they should fully faithfully in condensed being groups. Um, so now you have a nice home to, to play with them, but then, uh, but then because you, you have an being category that somehow has all X groups and, and then you can wonder what they actually are. And for this theory to be somehow useful, you want that all the answers of, of these X computations, they give you reasonable answers that are inter inter interpretable. Um, and so the first theorem that I stated last time is the following theorem. So, um, uh, one thing you can do is you can start with, uh, for example, a uh, nice geometric object like a CW complex. Um, and let's say M is any B in group. Uh, then one can uh, look at the X groups. In light condensed being groups uh, between the free condensed being group on X, or rather on the corresponding condensed set, uh, and M. M is treated as some of with a speed guy. Um, and this, I mean, basically. If you treat X as a condensed set, then in any topos there is this internal notion of what cohomology is, which one way to express what this internal notion is is somehow use X groups in the B and sheets. Um, so this is some of the internal notion of what cohomology of X with coefficients in N is in the condensed world. Uh, and fortunately, it turns out that this precisely recovers uh, the singular cohomology of X with closing condensed sets. Okay, um, so uh, the first thing I probably want to do today is uh, sketch the proof of the theorem. Um, um, so maybe I should say that uh, to a large part, I will uh, in this lecture and maybe also in the next one or two still follow uh, the first course that I gave on condensed uh, mathematics uh, some years ago, and you can find the lecture notes online. So like. So much of what I'm talking about today uh, and of last time, so the reference is a condensed PDF that you can find on my reference. <clears throat> um, okay, so the first sketch is that, well, as it's a CW complex, it's somehow an increasing union <clears throat> of some XI where the XI are complex cross curves. Um, it's risable also. And they're built from five dimensional cells. Uh, and in some sense, both sides uh, take, uh, take whole limits to limits, yeah. Uh, uh, so they take whole limits. With right limits. Uh, and then you probably need a slightly 
bigger statement there to really compare to complexes, not just the individual groups. But basically, uh, you, you can reduce to the case that you just have a compact cost of space. So we used to. Um, so there's a compact, uh, compact CW complex. Um, then there's actually is a more general statement. Uh, that holds uh, for compact cluster space that may not uh, be like CW complex good from cells. Um, that's the following theorem. Uh, and again, M E M and B and group. Um, uh, All right, so then um, you, you, I mean, you still have these X groups in and then the groups between the free guy on X uh, and N. It turns out that in this case, you can always compute this as what's known as a sheet cohomology on X with coefficients in N. So here, um, sheet cohomology. <clears throat> so this is defined in terms of the category of sheets on being groups on X. So you consider of the topological space X or its corresponding side. Um, and there's heaps of being groups on X. <clears throat> uh, and then Uh, then you have a global sections functor. It goes to being groups. Uh, it's not right exact, so it has the right drive functors. That's in order to distinguish it from other topologies that might arise. I do not know this HI sheet. X explain. And here you apply this to the constant sheaf. Uh, <clears throat> on an end of being group N. <clears throat> and it is known that Uh, so are restricted to CW complexes satisfies the Albert exterior road axioms and thus it is the same as singular homology. So, so uh, if X is a CW complex. This is a case of similar ones. Uh, but not in general. Uh, in fact, basically, I'm not sure if never, but 
And if you think about cohomologies, really only evaluate for CW complexes. In general, you should rather use something like shift cohomology or uh, the same thing is actually change cohomology. Um, so here's a key example to keep in mind of relevance to us. If X is totally disconnected, then, well, it's totally disconnected. So in this case, you can actually show that the global sections uh, functor is already exact. Uh, so the chief cohomology. So do you mean totally disconnected compact? I mean, a uh, night. Yeah, as I'm still in this, uh, I, uh, sorry, yeah, compact also. <coughs> so profile and set. Um, these are the global sections, and the global sections uh, are just uh, locally constant maps. From x to n, for equal to zero, and uh, there's no higher cohomology. But if you would consider the singular cohomology, and this is defined in terms of the uh, singular cochain complex, uh, which is built from just mapping points and uh, simplices into, into x. But from the perspective of all simplices, there's no way to tell apart x from just a discrete set of points, right? Because it's totally disconnected. Um, so any connected space will just factor over one point. So, but when you come, so you can also compute the singular cohomology of x, the thickness in m. And again, it's vanishes in positive degrees, uh, but in degree zero, you get all of this. Continuous or not. <laughs> um, so this means that, um, yeah, so the singular cohomology doesn't really see anything about the topology of X anymore. Uh, the chief cohomology does. So I think another another possibility is to consider locally contractible spaces. I believe that when you cross X with an interval, this X group should not change. I'm not completely sure what it looks like. And then yeah. one can do for locally contractible comparison with chief cohomology. And if in addition, it is paracompact, then you get comparison the singular cohomology with the usual results on. Yes, yes, you're actually right, yeah. So actually, yeah. I think, yeah, the key statement you really need about X is that it's locally contractible in this funny sense, where locally contractible doesn't mean it's covered by open, or that any point has a basis of open neighborhoods that are contractible, but rather that for any point in any neighborhood, you can find a smaller, possibly smaller neighborhood that can be contracted in the larger one. And under this funny assumption, that's the official definition of locally contractible, uh, you can actually show that, uh, yeah, I think everything that I said about CW complexes uh, extends to this thing. But uh, to compare shift and singular cohomology, the usual treatment requires paracompact. I'm not sure if it yeah, is. So, yeah, so maybe paracompact, yes, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think these paracompactness assumptions, they would, they kind of only matter in the immediate set of chief cohomology. I think if you go all the way back to here, I think it probably disappears again. <clears throat> yes? Yes, I understand the question. So the question was, uh, <clears throat> um, like often one considers topological space up to weak equivalence. And uh, then obviously, and everything is weakly equivalent to CW complex. And for example, X is weakly equivalent to just the discrete set of points. But here I don't want to consider topological space up to weak equivalence. Because I, otherwise I would, 
I wouldn't be able to treat totally disconnected space at all. So I'm not using here topological space or condensed or whatever to do a pure homotopy theory. I really am interested in the actual topological space. Um, uh, right. Uh, so, okay. So here's the theorem now. Right. So I want to now prove that if I have a metrizable compact house space in any of the group, uh, then I can compare this X groups. Um, and this can actually be further, further upgrade. And I mean, I'm not doing this up here purely really for fun. It's actually somehow actually important for the proof. Um, uh, here's the first upgrade you can do. Um, so sheet cohomology was defined. So there are two sides. Fix X. On the one hand, you have X. So it's called the open of X. Um, So this is what, what's used on, on the right. And on the other hand, <clears throat> you can consider a slice, a slice of the topos defining um, light condensed sets. So you can consider light profile sets together with a map to X. Um, and uh, Um, and right, once you pass the sheaves, or once you pass the corresponding topoi, <clears throat> uh, turns out that that's actually a geometric morphism here. So, um, these here, here are light condensed sets with a map to X. And these are schemes on X, and there is map lambda here. <coughs> um, so, what I'm telling you is that whenever you have a scheme over X, you can pull it back uh, to get a light condensed set over X. And to define what the pullback is, you really only have to define all the generating objects. So lambda alpha star of u, when u is an open subset of x, um, is just u. Of course, that's so maybe it should also be x. <clears throat> okay, so uh, here's the usual sheets on x. And you can pull them back to get like uh, condensed sets of X. Um, and corresponding here also has to some of the derived category of sheets on X, which is used to define the sheets cohomology. And you have uh, the derived category of B and sheets on there, which would define this other cohomology. So basically, you can uh, get also a pullback functor on derived category. So you just consider the derived category of sheets on X. Okay, see what next um, goes to the rough category of um, the B and C's over X. Um, and then uh, first application of the theorem is that on 
uh, if you are bounded to the left, also on V plus, uh, lambda plus the full back is fully fixed. <clears throat> and in particular, this means that uh, X groups, which are some kind of forms, um, are the same. In particular, this implies that for all F, which are which are in the of being groups on X, um, the cohomology uh, on on the top of condensed sets over X with coefficients in over X is the same thing as the cohomology. Okay. And if so, you apply this to a constant sheaf, uh, you, you will recover the previous. So this is for X locally compact? Um, what kind of a sum? I was having in mind the case where X is a compact host space. Um, uh, probably power compact would be good. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so if you apply this to the constant sheaf on the being group, we get uh, the previous version. And maybe this is also a bit scary, but then the point is just that chief cohomology is defined in terms of cohomology on some side, and the other is basically also just cohomology on some side. And so um, then the, the original claim was that for a certain very specific sheet, maybe a constant sheet, uh, they have the same cohomology, but actually something much more robust is true that for any sheet, the cohomology is in green, uh, which can be rephrased in terms of such a fully faceful functor. Okay, so uh, let me sketch the argument. Um, uh, we need uh, that on any object in the cluster. Uh, being sheets on X, uh, the adjunction map from A to um, the push forward of the pullback of A is an isomorphism. <laughs> and so this is a um, this is a certain map in D plus X these so being groups on X. <clears throat> and then it's just a general fact that uh, you can check whether there's such a thing as an isomorphism by checking it on stalls. And this is really the key point where uh, I'm kind of using uh, the Stokos theoretic formalism. Uh, in order to make the reduction to checking something on coins. Thoughts. Uh, uh, <clears throat> points of X. <clears throat> so we want that 
AX maps isomorphically. Oh, right. We, we wonder whether this map isomorphically to. Oh, this thing. And now the key point is that you can actually uh, have suitable base change properties that allow you to pull taking the stalk uh, into this uh, into this um, into this push forward operation. So the key point. A base change property. Taking solve that X commutes. Let's see. Oh, from that one. And this is where you actually use something about the nature of the scope of condensed sex. Um, namely, you use it. Um, so in situations of so-called coherent topoi, uh, you often have such kind of base change results. Uh, so you use general uh, homology for the interest of polymers. Taking the stock of some kind of filter polymer and taking all of the lower stuff in kind of homology. Uh, and there are certain statements when you can interchange them. Uh, results uh, for, and this hold the generality of so-called coherent topoi. <clears throat> and coherent is just uh, basically the same thing as being quasi-compact and quasi-separated. And so in the end, what you see is that the key thing you really need uh, at this point, uh, so the key geometric input, so to say, <coughs> is that this condensed set corresponding to X, that in this internal uh, internal language of this topos of what it means to be somewhat compact and house it is compact and house it is quasi compact and quasi separation. Which was precisely the thing I mentioned last time that uh, if you want to do know this, for example, for the interval, you need to know that there is a subjection from the from one of the generating objects on our side to contrast towards the interval. So implicitly here you're using that you can cover something like the interval or something like this by uh, by the contrast. Sorry, Peter, Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Why do you use the bounded assumption in this group? <clears throat> um, because otherwise, uh, this statement doesn't hold true in general. Um, or, well, okay. Uh, yeah, so if you don't have left, things that are bounded to the left, there is always some issue of how commodity changes with like this cosmic of limits. And there are all sorts of very subtle questions uh, that. Uh, So basically, there's at least three versions of which way you can do this. There's Lewis version, uh, which is maybe the best one. And then there is just the rough category of sheaves. And then there is uh, select completion. And, uh, 
if you want to fully face from C, you should always take the left completion. I mean, all of this doesn't matter if X is like a CW complex or if it's five dimensional, then everything's the same. But <clears throat> this kind of general statement that it always holds true in equal and triples, this only works when you're bounded to the left, otherwise there are some issues. So I believe you, you want to take a to regard the point as a limit of its closed neighborhoods rather than open neighborhoods. Yeah, so yes, exactly. So if you actually want to execute uh, what I gave here is some of the hint, um, <clears throat> then you actually have to use it. I mean, a priori this is the filter element of all open neighborhoods of X, but when you're in a compact hostel space, these are co final with the closed neighborhoods. So you can set take the closed neighborhoods here, which has the advantage that then if you, so a callback a closed neighborhood, you actually get some co finite set. Yeah. So I want to stay within the realm of positive complex by separated objects for which you need to take the close neighborhoods, but you can just do that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, um, thus, we can pull in uh, taking the stalk at X. Um, and now this basically means that we've reduced to the same statement, but now the space X has to just become a point. Uh, so this reduces. Oh, okay, but, but if it's a point and all these I mean, this is just the RFK being groups. Well, this is still something non trivial. It's still the whole RFK of life and it's being groups, but some of the being groups are fully faithfully in there because. Oh. Yeah. This, this is it. Basically, I mean, the integers as a condenser being group, they are still projective, so they execute just to the same. Okay, next to yeah. Maybe you have explained, but uh, is, it, is it obvious that this all lambda star moves with this uh, two back to close the name of it? No, I mean, you have to somehow use it. These are somewhat intertwined to open the closed neighborhood. So definitely can be just pull back to open neighborhoods, but then the transition is from if you have two open neighborhoods and the cohomology, then some of the cohomology on the closed or the cohomology on the pullback, they're, they're both sit in between. So on the filter cohomology, it doesn't matter which one you check. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is the definition of the Um, let me just uh, pause a second and uh, let, let me try to understand what happened here more concretely. Uh, so back, so we were interested in computing some X groups from the X is my trial for contact cost. And we're interested in computing, well, let's just say uh, on some computing C. <clears throat> then we would like, like now I took it like a very fancy approach, but we could try to do it more, somewhat more down to earth. So how do you actually try to compute X groups in, in light tendency being groups? You would try to find a projective resolution. And if you, you cannot find one that's projective, at least you would want to find that's acyclic for this function. <clears throat> um, 
Um, and so this actually breaks us uh, proof in two steps. So step one is, is to show that if X is actually totally disconnected, then you don't actually have to do anything. So then X group, I mean, so in this case, it's one of these generating objects in our side, right? So like, it's someone, it is, in this case, some live profile set. So let me write really S, S here. Um, that this is, um, so the continuous maps from S into G, so the local constant map, is I is equal to zero, uh, and nothing in positive degree. <clears throat> and, Okay, so for if S is, for example, the one point of rectification of the integers, this really just falls from the statement I proved last time that this is a projective object. But in general, this is not, and for the country set, and a priori, you still have to resolve this guy. <clears throat> uh, but for the, uh, so this comes down to the following. Um, <clears throat> Like if there was some, for example, some X1 against C, then you could always split this X1 after you pass to a cover of S by what it means that it's an exact sequence. Um, and, uh, and so similarly, if there's some high X group, you can always split this after like passing to some kind of uh, uh, infinite resolution uh, of the sky. And so <clears throat> concretely what this amounts to is that for all so-called hyper covers, Um, how this is called. So this is some uh, superficial object, superficial light for finite set. Um, so there's a zero, there's a one, so on, uh, mapping to S. So concretely, this means that S0 is a cover of S. And then uh, you can recover S as a quotient by this uh, fiber product, S0 times SS0. And so, but then the next one is required to subject onto the fiber product <coughs> and so on. Uh, where and so on uh, takes a little bit of effort on, on reveling. Um, so whenever you have such a guy, um, there's actually some completely general things that in any site, if you have uh, an object with a hyper cover, then you can build the corresponding chain complex by dot can't. Um, <laughs> this is actually always exact. <clears throat> and you need to see that it. Uh, um, when you somehow dualize and pretend that this should be the answer, you would want that if I now pass the corresponding complex of continuous functions, that this is still exact. And this is not what you have to prove. So we need to show for all hypercovers, so it's this, this exactly is automatic. What we need to show is that um, 
the corresponding complex of continuous maps. The two is also exact. <coughs> and uh, there are several ways to prove this. One is to use the same argument I used, which is to somehow argue that in order to prove this exactness, you treat everything here can be treated as a sheaf on S, because in some, instead of taking global section, you can first push everything to S and then take global sections. And then it's enough to prove the exactness of sheaves on S, which again, you can check on stalls. And then again, when you pass the stalls, you realize that it's some of the same thing where now you're uh, covering a point. They have a cover of a point, but then again, because it's a point, there's it's a hyper cover split and there's nothing to do. <clears throat> uh, so there's one way. The other way is to uh, prove something, some abstract level that whenever you have a hyper cover of profinite sets by profinite sets, you can always write this as some co filtered limit of hyper covers of finite sets by finite sets. <clears throat> and then this writes this thing as some filtered co limit of corresponding things where everything is a finite set. But then for a finite set, also all hypercovers are split and the exactness is automatic. I think that the latter argument is the one I actually used in the lecture notes back then. So the, the first argument is like homological descent in SGA4. And I think that they also check, I forgot in which reference, uh, but in one of the the, the proper base change theorem for uh, separate for uh, proper maps in the sense of Ubakis, they separated with universe closed maps, and so and then the arguments in in cohomological descent go through, and uh, it will give this. Uh, so the cohomological descent spectral sequence will give you this result. Right. Yeah. I guess the previous thing on the rough categories was, that, I guess it's called homology with the more or less. Um, uh, so either that or uh, right, you have a cover. And the core for that limit. Hypercovers. Finite sets, but finite sets. It actually takes a little bit of unraveling that you can always do this, but uh, it's okay. Um, to reduce to the case of finite sets where it's obvious. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, the first step. If you try to do this more concretely, but maybe also the less interesting step because we're still just treating these totally disconnected spaces. <clears throat> And now, uh, so step two is to somehow treat uh, general. Uh, it's risable compact cost of X. <clears throat> and so we would again like to find uh, such an acyclic resolution. And now, now we actually found a lot of acyclics because now we know that for all smoothly disconnected guys, at least it is acyclic, right? So now it's enough to find out a projective resolution by one by such you know, joint S squares as any like for finite set. Um, so we want to resolve the joint X uh, by the joint S's, uh, where S is a large for finite set. And so how does one actually do that? Well, one uses precisely that. One uses that one, you can uh, you can always find the subjection from the counter set. So from, from that, some like profile set onto X. 
and then you get some equivalence relation and zero times s is zero. Um, and this is actually, uh, I mean, if s zero is already a totally disconnected and s zero times s zero is, and this is a closed subspace if you take the fiber product. So this is actually always totally disconnected. Uh, so you don't even have to do any further resolution. So you can, uh, so-called chase nerve where um, it just, This is minus one, this is minus two. And then all these SIs are just some I plus one fold fiber product of X. Um, we have some hyper or in fact chest cover. Um, let's pull it to X. <clears throat> and so again, by this general principle, the hyper covers give you resolutions, you now get such a resolution as you draw an X. But, are these three guys on these terms. So this is my resolution by things that are asynchronous for sort of something. Okay. And so this tells us that the cohomology you're interested in this X group from this guy, this can be computed by letting these guys in. And so we, now we know that this guy here is computed. By this complex where you take here the continuous functions from a zero to three integers. <clears throat> Which is some really awkward formula for what like something like single homology. So you take your you cover your uh, nice phase X, maybe the interval, by some country set, and then all the spider products, and then everywhere you take just the locally constant function to the integers, and then all this. Any complex, and the claim is that this computes a user cohomology. And uh, now it's not so clear a priori that it really computes the right thing. And to, what the previous proof amounts to is to check that to, to again treat all of these things here as sheaves on X, so as the global sections of some sheaves on X, and then to check that um, this computes the right thing, you can again somehow compute on stops, and then you're done. And then we check that it resolves the function chains. Sorry, sorry. Does this argument also work for non-constant sheaves? Or? Yeah, that's what I previously said, right? Uh, that uh, this, uh, there was a statement, funny, uh, fancy statement about the RF categories, and then said, in particular, it says that for all sheaves of being groups on X, the cohomology, the sheaf cohomology on X is the same thing as what happens when we do this condensed stuff. All right. <clears throat> uh, so next, I want to talk about 
uh, locally compacted DD systems. Uh, so yeah, so there is this pedigree of like topological groups that are low topological being groups that are locally compact. Um, um, here, <clears throat> so what are some examples of optics in here? Well, also the speed of being used on the and then I don't know the wheels are there or uh, something like the wheels module the integers to the circle or the periodic numbers on there or something also something nice like the adults, which is uh, one nice thing about the adults is that they sit in a short effect sequence where you have a discrete sub and then a mod two. So this complex and the drivable and this street. Um, we recall that the adults are uh, the profile completion of the integers rationalized. <coughs> um, I don't know. And so there is some kind of structure theory for these guys. Uh, uh, so each object can be broken up into three pieces. It makes a filtration of three pieces. So one piece is the script. One piece is uh, is a finite dimensional real vector space, and one piece is a compact product of the these groups. I was getting confused about the order. So let me just say. Right, so, uh, so as you see, there are some kind of interesting uh, sort of effect sequences in there. So you definitely expect that there's some kind of, for example, an X1 group of like R mod Z with the Z, which is with the extent of the real numbers or something like this. Uh, but so like two, uh, two things that one someone knows about this category is that, uh, 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 it seems to be a, like, yeah, so, so, so uh, computing Yonida X from this guy. So this is some kind of exact category and computing Yonida X is uh, some kind of non-trivial. Uh, one knows that all the XIs are equal to zero for at least two. <clears throat> and all X ones, yeah, I don't know. 
Um, and so you can wonder whether something similar holds true now if you, if you compute X groups uh, inside condensing groups. So, okay. So let's take any two locally complex Abelian groups, which are also metrizable. Um, and then again, this metrizability assumption can be ignored. It only comes from uh, the restriction to large condensed Abelian groups. Uh -huh. <clears throat> then you can com compute the X groups in like condensed being groups from the corresponding guys. And <clears throat> I mean, just from the fully faithfulness, uh, you already know that the homomorphisms they can't be changed. They must just be the usual topological homomorphism there. Uh, but after all, there could be some weird X1 groups that you didn't know about. I mean, here you're computing X tangents within the core category of condensed being groups, and there could be some really weird X groups between them. And I will actually later, maybe hopefully today, it's got an example where this actually happens. Um, uh, but here, Turns out that not so. All the X groups, all the extensions of a locally compact guy by a locally compact guy in condensed groups, they all are themselves the extensions of themselves the locally compact between group, and really you can identify the abstract X point with the unit X point. Now it's the usual thing where it's uh, you're looking at solid like sequences A to something to B. Uh, uh, no, let's go. Yes. Uh, sorry. B to something to A to zero. Uh, solid like sequences in locally compacted being groups up to the appropriate loss of the ones. <clears throat> so let me give some key uh, examples. I actually, I mean, even something slightly better is, I mean, you could even underline this. Um, um, so first of all, you can compute X groups of anything against the circle group as one. Let me write that one thing. Um, so this is actually zero in positive degrees. Uh, so this points on a prontary eigenduality, and the prontary eigenduality is some kind of exact operation on locally compact Abelian groups, and it's precisely the dual Abelian group, as a dual of locally compact Abelian group in degree zero. Um, or uh, another example one could do. You could also try to compute some X groups of the real numbers against the integers, uh, where some of the intuition is that the real numbers have something connected, so it can never map to the integers which are a discrete thing. And so you would expect all the IX groups to be zero and those indeed to fix. Um, <clears throat> lots of things you can write down. Um, and I think actually these are more or less the key examples. So um, Thank <laughs> you. 
I mean, <coughs> to understand uh, this computation, some of you all have to do all, you can do some of the visage where A and B can be reduced to these basic cases. And so, for example, if you map from something to this discrete, then there's not really anything to show because then the X is easy to compute. And so you can assume basically you have a compact retrieval Gaussian group in the source because also the finite dimensional real vector spaces you have a divisage to something discrete and something compact. Main thing is for this you can assume that A is compact, and then you can try to do a similar divisage in D and so. But how does one actually go about computing anything here? Uh, so, so we need to find. Something close to a projective resolution. Of A. For, for every this uh, locally compact abelian group, it can be up to R to the N. Is extension of a discrete by a compact so. right um there's no sign yeah i think it says okay um okay. and for this uh the key is actually uh no. is there a question uh a certain resolution that uh, works in extreme generality that and that was used quite a bit by Green in a certain setting in uh, algebraic geometry to do some computations. Uh, but the statement we needed was never actually put into literature by Green. There is an unpublished letter of Deline to Green where he proves the result, uh, but it's somewhat unpublished. Um, uh, but it's a following very nice uh, theorem. Uh, let me use an interesting board for this. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> there is a Resolution of the form um, something uh, functorial in a being group sense. Uh, so what is the resolution? So you're trying to resolve any any being group M, and you're some, trying to find some kind of Universal projective resolution of this. So you're trying to somehow resolve results by free being groups. <clears throat> and there's, of course, a very easy way to resolve, at least find a surjection onto M, uh, where you send some of the generator given by some element of M to, to M as an element in here. There's some of the finite free being group on generated by the elements of M, right? Um, but of course, this is way, way bigger than this. And um, <clears throat> So the standard way actually to, to do this is to do some kind of monadic resolution where you use a, some of the free being group monad and then there is some kind of general thing that the next term, I mean, you might put here and this would be not what I want to do. You could put here the free guy the being group on the free being group on M and then there are kind of two maps here and then the difference you use here and then you can continue. But then these things get uncontrollably large. So this is not what you want to do. <clears throat> And you realize that actually you don't need something as big as this to generate a kernel because really 
So the only thing you really have to enforce is that when you add two elements of n, then you they become the same as the sum, right? So basically, you just have to whenever you have a pair of elements of m, um, and so here generators are certain pairs a b, uh, you can send it to a plus b minus a plus b, <clears throat> and it's easy to check that this actually generates a kernel of this map because once you uh, prescribe those relations, then you can uniquely sum any such thing. And you realize you can uniquely reduce to just a norm at the end. Um, and then you can continue. So each term will just be C adjoined some uh, Z to M to some some power. Um, and there are some transition maps that are given by some universal formulas like this, except nobody's able to write them down. Do you have to take a finite direct sum or in each term of, of such powers, or it's enough to have one power? Like maybe, yeah, maybe so, so when, when we originally wrote this up, we used to find direct sum of these things. Um, but you can actually, by some stupid argument, you can basically cover any such finite direct sum again by such a free guy. Uh, oh, okay, no, I see, I see. Okay, it's uh, you will actually realize that there's a small issue with a zero, uh, but you will figure it out. Um, uh, but yes, you, you can just choose one term in, in each degree. Um, um, yeah, and so all the differentials are given by some universal formulas, which is actually a consequence of the functor reality. All differentials. Things like universal formulas. So it's a little bit of a meta mathematical result. Yeah? Uh, and surprisingly, uh, the proof of the theorem uses a little bit of stable homotopy theory. So it uses the fine, in some incarnation, it uses something like the finiteness of the stable homotopy groups of spheres. And that they appear in the proof is somehow also the reason that you don't really know how to do this explicitly because at some point you need to basically kill something like stable homotopy groups of spheres, meet suggestions from finite free groups onto them, and when you can't do that, you won't get anything explicit. Um, but uh, so, one very nice thing is that this is really functorial. And so this means that this immediately works in any topos. So in any topos, you can now write down the same complex, the same universal formulas. But whenever you have a sheaf of the being groups, you can write down the same complex as sheaves of the being groups on that side, and it will automatically be exact. So uh, by functionality or really the universal formulas, uh, it also works for the against sheaves in any topos. And so we now get a resolution of our of our A that we're interested in, where all the terms are some Z adjoint A or Z adjoint A squared or some Z adjoint A. <clears throat> and so in order to compute X groups from here, there's some reduced to computing X groups from these three guys on them. <clears throat> but this is precisely the thing that I, I was talking about previously. So X groups from such guys, three guys on some nice topological uh, spaces, this is precisely what we already know how to do. 
So this reduces fixation. X groups out of A. The X groups out of Z join A to the N. And uh, this is what we already said. So, so let us say that you want to compute X with values in R underlined. So you have a complex where you have the terms are uh, continuous functions on powers of A with values in the real, in the real. Yeah, so, yeah, so I only did the case where the target was a discrete being group. For the theorem, I also need to case where the target uh, are the real numbers. <clears throat> um, yeah, so if you look back at what I did in this uh, notes on uh, condensed cosmetics, then there are also proofs that for any compact host of space, uh, you can compute some of the X group of Z join X into R. Oh, so I also need to make a sense in it here. Uh, for all X compact hostel. <coughs> you compute, I mean, right, this is X group, so some of it from all the independence world. Uh, from X, but now with real coefficients. And then the claim is that this actually doesn't have any higher homology, whatever X is. And in degree zero, of course, it just gets a continuous function. Uh, this also works. Uh, with R replaced by any banner space. Uh, but it doesn't work if it's just, uh, if it, but it really uses local convexity. <laughs> because there's some partition of unity argument in the proof. Oh. So you know that the partition of unity behave nicely, you need that the target vector space is locally complex. Uh, sorry, uh, but that's extremely important. I write this X group, like, of course, mean from the tree that I have. Uh, so, as a preview of something that will happen later, is that <clears throat> when we consider real vector spaces in our theory, we will actually have to consider non locally convex vector spaces. <clears throat> and so we will actually really be interested in situations of such computations where the time is not locally convex, and then we do not have suspension on all convex host spaces. And then <clears throat> this means that we will actually have to resolve 
So when we want to resolve by acyclic, we really have to go to a totally disconnected system. <coughs> uh, all right, so let me give an example of how such computation will come out. <coughs> so when you're trying to compute the X groups of the reals against integers, um, uh, then, excuse me, that X, X zero is uh, sounds okay. cool. No, I think that's right. It's a Holmes from the free guy on X. All right, but if you want to map the free guy, you just have to map this guy into R and this is precisely because it is maps. No, it isn't with triangles, right? Hmm? You need the triangles? Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, so when you when you compute it when you compute that, then you're resolving this by the free guy on R, so then the free guy on R squared and so on. Free guy on some oh, and sign them in the real vector space, <clears throat> and then we know. I mean, find the real vector space that's definitely the CW complex. So we know that the X groups of the is on out to the NI, you can see. Um, oh, sorry, there's, there's some two eyes here. <coughs> and yeah, um, that this is, uh, well, it's the same thing as a singular commodity of this term. Rn, and so this is of course just b in degree zero and zero in positive degree. <clears throat> and so this means that uh, when you compute the x groups out of this, then each term will just give you one copy of z. Uh, you would like this to be zero uh, uh, for all equations to zero. So upper you might be worried that there is some more lots of z still remaining, and maybe you don't know what the differentials are, but one way to control this is to observe that you can do a stupid thing of also using this revolution for zero. Um, so the zero group, <coughs> which resolves the zero group by several properties of the integers. Um, and then you realize that when you compute x out of this, Sequence, it's the same thing as computing x loops here because each term individually has the same x groups. And so then out of here is the same as out of here, but this just resolves zero. So, <clears throat> okay, so this is how uh, one can leverage this knowledge about uh, the, uh, the x groups from these three guys on reasonable things into. Uh, such x groups from locally compacted data groups. Um, let me actually mention a variant uh, of this argument. So <clears throat> one might be worried that one is one, having some, it's kind of weird when it's trying to do very explicit computations by using an inexplicit resolution. Uh, but some of the inexplicit nature of this resolution somehow never becomes an issue. Um, to just the existence of such a resolution in these finalist properties is, is enough. Uh, but actually, there is a resolution that is explicit and that can also be used. So this is this, uh, 
something known as McLean's Q or Q prime construction, and which was rediscovered by Ivan Tomley in the process of this formalization effort. Um, uh, so this is an explicit complex. It starts just like we expect. So we take Z to an end and then we take Z to an end squared. Uh, where here this map is just given by sending A B to A sub B. Um, and then uh, it's just a free guy on one thing where now these are powers of two. So this is Z to an end to the four. Z to an end to the eight. Uh, it's also called the cubical construction. I think the Q is for cubical. Um, and uh, let me try to write it down here. Uh, so if you now have A, B, C, D, um, then you imagine this as the four corners, A, B, C, D. Um, and then you are uh, taking the face, this face, so you add them up minus the difference of the faces. So this maps to... A B plus C D minus A plus C D plus C. Oh, I, hope I, I hope I'm doing this right. I might be also screwing this up. Um, and then you do this on the other face too. So we would take minus A C minus B D plus A plus B D plus C. And I hope you can check that if you compose the two differentials, you get zero. And if not, then there is some easy variant of this which should work. <clears throat> and uh, now you can imagine how you do this one step up. So you imagine now n to the eight is where the four, the eight uh, elements are sit on the uh, vertices of a cube. And then you, this side minus this side, plus, and plus, this side plus this side minus the sum of the sides, and then you reach the right <clears throat> And then there is a theorem uh, that uh, this is kind of linear in M. So more precisely, Q of M is always quasi-isomorphic to Q of Z, base change, uh, derived base change to M. So in particular, if you look at all the homology groups, so if M is totally free, this just means that uh, the homology of this cubical construction is just a linear functor of them. <clears throat> In general, there's some extra to one term. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, this linearity in M turns out to be kind of sufficient. Uh, So, uh, so uh, it's i from a to b is zero for all i greater equal to zero. If and only if all the x groups from this explicit complex to be are zero. By some easy induction. <clears throat> and so basically, all the theorems we're trying to prove, they can be proven to the form that some x groups should vanish for all i greater equal to zero. And then we can use this explicit resolution of A instead. I mean, it's not quite a resolution of A, but for this purpose, it's good enough. Um, and also, uh, another thing, you can actually compute uh, what this thing is in, using some little bit of stable homotopy theory. And you can show this actually in direct sum for all i greater equal to zero. Oh, like this. You know the algebra, so the self tender product of the integers of the integers of the sphere. You take two to the i copies of that and you shift it into degree i. <clears throat> so, this is where a little bit of stable homotopy series fits. So basically, whenever you write down something explicit, 
the explicit answer should have something to do uh, with algebra or something. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is just to say that instead of an explicit resolution, you can also all do all of these arguments with this explicit resolution instead. It doesn't really change any of the arguments except we've, you have a little bit of more comfort if that you actually know which objects you are. Uh, it's just the sequence of zero exists, it's not a direct sum. You, I, think you I think it actually is a direct sum. I think not. You think not? Yes. Uh, I think that the, the first statement is it just confused the, the sequence of zero. Uh, and sorry, and there's a Q, so that's Q and there's Q prime. So there's actually a modification that they make a claim that. Ah, sure, yeah, I mean. Where you kind of kill something yeah. extra and then you just get these into. Yeah, but if you take reduce, then. Reduce. Then, then you, you're, yeah. you're moving all this. Yeah, All right, um, and so finally, I can say one corollary that's really important uh, for the theory of so called solid that we use. Uh, uh, let's say all the speed of being exempt. <coughs> one thing you can now compute. Is an X group of something that's not at all now anymore uh, locally compact, but actually quite big. Namely, you can take the whole product of a countable number of copies of the integers. So the product infinitely dangerous. So or if you want, you can take the, the product in topologically being groups and then pass through the group. Gives you the same answer. Um, so these X groups uh, turns out that they're actually just the direct sum copies of them. So I see what we do. And so this is very different from the classical answer where I which is FP that I mean this would be the naive dual of a countable product of copies of FP, which is a huge vector space, but now like now we're looking at some of the continuous things, and now we just get the direct sum. And the really critical thing is that there's nothing in higher degrees. And so this guy, uh, this will be the com the compact projective generator of solid beam. Solid, which is a full subcategory of commentaries. <coughs> <clears throat> and all discrete being groups should be solid. And then if you want it to be projective, you definitely want that all the high X groups and this is what's asserted by this theorem. Or this column, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, prove that. So this you actually use a weird trick. Um, so naively, you would now again try to resolve this by three guys on profile sets. But the issue is that this is a really large thing as a. Uh, here's a warning sign. So if you if you treat this here as a <clears throat> as a condensed set, uh, then this is somehow a union 
overall functions from, from n to, to n uh, of the product over n of the interval from minus f of n plus f of n. And the, the integer interval. Uh, so whenever you somehow take a bound, for each n, you choose a bounded subset, the finite subset of here, and the product is some profinite set. In general, it's a huge unit of these. But this is a huge co limit here. I mean, of cardinality is a continuum. And so now, uh, if you map out such a huge co limit, a priori, this would become a huge limit that's a priori extremely hard to control. Uh, and, uh, so this approach would actually be extremely hard to execute. Uh, but there's a trick you can do. Maybe you can resolve now in, in the other direction, that seems weird. Uh, so you can embed this into a product of copies of the real numbers. This is a similarly huge thing. Uh, and then you get a product of copies of R mod Z. Uh, at this point, we crucially use uh, that products are exact, possible products. It might be easier to justify in this specific case, but uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, so this is exact. Um, and now, now we're trying to compute X against, uh, so this one gives us the X from here and to the X from here and the X from here. Uh, let's do this one first. So this is actually a compact that we agree. A tribable. It's still a tribable, right? So it's a countable product. Uh, compact that we can do. <clears throat> and so we know what the X groups are. So the X, I, our product copies of R1T into elements. Uh, <clears throat> Turns out that this is, well, this is discrete and this is something connected, so there shouldn't be any homomorphisms. And then it turns out that in degree one, uh, the computation will show that this is just a direct sum of copies of M. And nothing can be I mean, this is what the result of the previous theorem on Rebels do. Uh, in this case. Um, and uh, then if you stare at the long six sequence, you realize that what you need is that <clears throat> the X groups from this product of uh, copies of the real stem is equal to zero. For all I can think. Uh, and now probably we're still in the same kind of situation where this is some kind of huge thing. Uh, and now, okay, there are two ways to know uh, to finish the argument. Either you can observe that if you do a similar operation now with this guy, then each yeah. of the terms here becomes a product of intervals. So each of the guy becomes a Hilbert cube. <clears throat> and actually, you can show that also for a Hilbert cube, it behaves like the highest in mean, this comparison is kind of singular cohomology is also true for the Hilbert cube and there's no higher cohomology. So the argument we gave for the real numbers works also for this Hilbert cube variant. Oh, there's a slightly different way of arguing. Uh, using a little bit of junctions. So the source here is some module. It admits a module structure over the real numbers. And so this means that the <coughs> uh, from the products of these things into any 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 them uh, will always be the same thing as the R home in modules, in condensed modules over this condensed ring R, 
uh, from this guy into the internal R on here. Uh, this is a general adjunction. Um, but now this internal R is already zero by, uh, by the previous. And so the whole thing. <clears throat> so we don't really need to know exactly what this is. It's enough to know that it's some module over the real numbers. And then because the real numbers don't map it in, uh, any module over the real numbers cannot map in either. Okay. Okay, so that's one of the key computations uh, that we needed. Um, which uh, kind of gives me, a, I mean, if I have maybe five minutes left, so let me talk about a fun serum with some set series proof. Um, so here's a serum. All right, let me consider the following conditions. Consider the following assertion star. So I'm um, trying to wonder in which generality is it true that I can pull such a product out and get a direct sum. So it's one of the continuous transform product that just like the effect over one of the terms. And maybe not just for products, but maybe even for like the sequential limit of things like we wonder that. So let's consider the following uh, assertion that for all uh, sequential limits, And zero and one <clears throat> um, of countable three different groups. And uh, and all possibly all the speed being not necessarily possible uh, and uh, that the expert from the sequential limit of these events towards n. That this is uh, the co limit of uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so general. And of course, <clears throat> this automatically vanishes the size of these uh, two because these are just X groups and the being groups, right? So whether, yeah, these are the speeds, so whether I compute the X groups and condenser being groups or just to be groups the same. So they vanish if I have at least two. Uh, and then the column also vanishes. <clears throat> uh, it's actually equivalent to, uh, to the following statement that if I take the X group of a product, so that I have some. Into a direct sum, uh, it is a zero. <clears throat> the point is that computing such a limit can be resolved by two term complex involving products of the N NNs. So computing this can be reduced to the case where this limit becomes replaced by a product. <laughs> then the NNs can be resolved by countable free abelian groups. <clears throat> So can reduce to uh, this form, and then similarly, n can be resolved by three guys. So, such computations can be reduced to, to this case. Okay. 
you mean the transition map is meta Gleffler or something like this? Uh, transition maps are subjective. Ah, oh, subjective, okay. <clears throat> Or with a clef level being uh, Okay, so that's, that's an assertion. And then, uh, so something that Dustin and I realized quickly is that if you assume the continuum hypothesis, uh, this fails. And so in fact, this exponent is non zero. So continuum repository follows that the cardinality of the continuum, so two to the other zero, is the first uncountable cardinal. And so Dustin and I kind of thought that maybe this is just too much to hope for. <clears throat> but then it turned out that some set theories independently considered the precisely the same question in a slightly different language. But uh, <clears throat> now you can kind of, kind of unravel what this X group amounts to here. Namely, again, this is some kind of huge co limit over certain functions from n to n uh, of the product over n of the direct sum over n at most f of n. These, where this is now finite direct sum, so this is the same thing as a product. Uh, and so it's a huge co limit of products of these for which we know the answer, and then you have to compute this whole huge limit here. <coughs> um, and so here's the theorem. Uh, so I think it's many people. I've been talking about uh, Bergfeld and Lambie Hansen, uh, who've written several papers about this, and the precise results I'm announcing are, I think, from Bernberg's Michel Fusak. And apparently, one of the statements I'm stating here, I'm not sure it has been published, but apparently, Benister has figured that out. <laughs> um, so, first of all, it's not just that this is excluded by star, but right? in fact, Star implies that uh, the continuum must be really large. The so truth of the all of zero must be bigger than all of omega. Uh, so basically, what happens, I think, is that if, <clears throat> if two to the all of zero is some all of n for some finite n, uh, then you will get some xn problems. But if you make it larger than all of n, then some, uh, uh, you have a chance. Uh, and in fact, uh, so it cannot actually be equal to all of omega by some Koenig's theorem. Um, what I proved is that actually the, the smallest bigger thing is consistent. Consistent that star holds. And you can also, uh, the first possibility after this can be real numbers. <laughs> in fact, uh, it holds but whenever you have any ground model, then you can extend this ground model by doing a co enforcing, it holds in the forcing extension. Uh, the joining bit only got many phone wheels. So Cohen, he invented this uh, notion of forcing that takes one model of set theory and builds a, another one, a bigger one, <clears throat> uh, in order to show that the continuum of process may be false. And this is like the most basic forcing. I mean, they know they say a billion <clears throat> different types of forcing, but this is still the most basic one where you just you join new real numbers, so to say, to your model, and you're just joining quite a lot of them. Some are, in some sense, all of omega would be the minimal thing that 
you can do in order to have a chance and well, you, I mean, bit omega many, but once you join that many bone reels to your model, uh, so the simplest kind of forcing extension, which will uh, ensure that this is true, um, turns out it always becomes true. Uh, okay. Um, and <clears throat> why do I mention this? Well, we don't actually ever, in this course, I will never use this principle star, um, but it's kind of neat to know that you can ensure it. Often when you try to compute certain things, it's easy to figure out what the answer would be if this was true. And then all the things you really need, you can usually prove them without invoking this general principle. But there are also some situations where you might want it, for example, in order to control X groups out of Banach spaces, um, where it really is the case that you get the expected answer under this principle star, uh, but um, in general, these X groups are just some concepts. Anyway, so, uh, time's up. Questions? Can I ask you a skill? I so in the first lecture, it comes from having the smallest possible weight. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I had a basic question. Yeah. So when you said that uh, when you computed the X groups for two locally compact leading groups, uh -huh. and then you said that these were zero for I greater than one, right? And you said this is just because you need a splitting phase of one. Like, I don't do. I, I, no, I mean, I did. I, sorry, I didn't want to refer to this. I mean, it's it's like. There's no simple reason. You actually have to do some computation that comes out as I agree. Oh, okay, okay. But in the end, it's somehow nice that it matches what would be the other day. Thank you. So, exactly. so I, I didn't catch the previous answer, but I, I want to ask again on this computation of. Uh, so, so for example, if you have a compact abelian group and you take the X to, to the reals, viewed as condensed, so you have a complex that computes it, was, the terms will be continuous functions on various powers of this compact group to the reals. Right. You, you have to compute that this is a cyclic in, in higher degree. So I don't see exactly how you do it. For the group cohomology complex, which is, you, you have this averaging by integrals, uh, but I don't know exactly what, what is the uh, method. Uh, I didn't actually look it up in preparation for this. Um, how does it work? So instead of mapping to the reals, it might also be that you want to map to the reals. Not... Sorry, how does it work? I know, no, so the argument is different. You use that. Um... <clears throat> ah. uh... How does this go? No, I mean, uh, uh, do, 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 do. okay, I can't think right now, but uh, you can find it in the lecture notes. <laughs> I don't see any further questions, so let's. Uh, uh,
So in, in the set theoretical thing, what was the call limit on the on the blackboard you are now uh, looking at? What is the X I of this is the call limit of what? And so he writes this thing as this huge call limit of all functions. And then you can write, I mean, just because you drive the right here indexed by the same index category. Where all the terms are now something you can write down. And, and then it's precisely these derived limits that they are studying in those papers. Okay, I understand now because we know that there is a cohomological dimension result for Aleph N. Uh, okay, so I, I see how it's related because we, if we could. That, I, saw, yeah, so it, it, I, I think there were all cohomological dimensions. Uh, functions uh, with a post set of eventual dominance. Then, under, for example, the continual hypothesis, this would be the same as omega 1. <clears throat> <laughs> and then such X groups in index by omega one, they tend to change to be bad. But the specific order type of this poset of functions ordered by eventual dominance yeah. depends extremely much on the specific model of sensory.